Um, wow. Guys, I have to say, this has been a consistently great evening so far. Do, would you guys agree? Woo! Um, so, <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, I have a couple of questions. I mean, I'm just going to start off with questions. If you have any questions, just put your hands up. Uh, you, okay, I'll, I'll get them. Okay, two of you there. Um, just so in all of your graphs, we had these exponentially, and, and if you looked at the axis, actually, the, the, the y-axis there, that wasn't even to scale. So those were even sharper. Yeah. Actually, those curves were even sharper. Um, but the one thing, and I think you touched upon it, and, and you said, well, this is kind of a plug for what we're doing, but it really wasn't because it's essential. It's an essential part of probably why you're doing things the way you're doing it. What happens if we have exponential growth in a closed system? Because I know of an experiment, a similar experiment, where you take a Petri dish and you put some bacteria in there and you give them a certain amount of uh, nutrients. And then you leave them be and you watch. And what happens is they reach their most populous stage one generation before they go extinct because of lack of resources. The Earth is a closed system. You know, apart from whatever interstellar dust we may or may not get every now and then, if we get too much of that in one go, that's not going to be good for us. Um, but so, wh what happens there? I mean, is what happens? Well, I, I, I mean, I think. Um, oh, you have a mic. Yeah, there. I, I think the you know the the march is inevitable, and therefore, actually, if the human race spent. 10% of the energy it spends creating the problem that we just want to consume more power on how to solve that problem, we get in a, a, a much better place. I'm, I'm a great believer that humans will solve this problem because we're not like that Petri dish, which is a relatively systematic way that it reproduces and then it dies. That we tend to seem to be able to do it. So, you know, hopefully we are going to make a big difference. Um, you know, from hydro's perspective, all of our power comes from water flowing down what it's got to get down anyway. I mean, it, it, it seems so simple that, you know, 500 miles away, there is a lake with 10 years' worth of water sitting in it that will power the entire of Sweden and so. So even if it didn't rain for the next 10 years, they just open the gates and that water flows down here. And we've got a hydro station right next to us. There's one a kilometre up. There's another one. There's another one. There are 17. Um, and the other big part of this is a lot of the energy is wasted because people think that servers need to run permanently. So a huge amount of energy goes missing in UPSs, and the energy it's made to create the uh, generators and all of the diesel. If you run a big data center, what you may not know is the diesel goes off and you probably never use it. So in a previous data center, every year and a half, we would pour down the drain 40,000 liters of diesel and go and get some new stuff. And, and this is the thing that, you know, and, and what that means is that where we are in Sweden, they have never had a power outage right. since 1972. Never. So I've got a follow-up question, a very quick one. Um, so we move to distributed systems, and everyone's connecting to everyone else. There's still going to be power requirements. Yeah. Um, how do you see the power requirements between a, a centralized, essentially a client server, or centralized, where you have these data centers, versus a distributed system? Well, I think, I think that is the reason that it will inevitably move to, to entirely distributed. And I hate to go on about Bitcoin mining. I hold my hand up. I'm, you know, we, we have a business that we do. But actually, my miners, it doesn't matter if they disappear for a minute, an hour, a day. They're stateless. They come straight back on. Uh, the network is big enough to keep it all running quite happily if I disappear for a minute, an hour. And we've built monolithic. Uh, computer systems, typically quite big enterprises, because that is in their interest to do that. And if you have a network that, where the computing power is distributed and nobody controls it, well, you don't need to make it resilient. And therefore, you don't need to waste all this power. And if we could move overnight to that, 
We're not talking about not building nuclear power stations. Now, whatever people in the, in the audience may or may not think about nuclear power stations, it is inevitable that the UK now has to build this because of the growth in power. And that is going to happen around the world. And therefore, either we change the way that we demand power or we just have to keep on building more and more power generation. And personally, I'd rather do more. I think that is distributed as good. Um, all right, let's, let's take a few questions because I could just spend the whole evening talking to you guys. Uh, there's a, a lady at the very back. Okay, so hi. Um, I'm really interested in the manifesto and what you think uh, we ought to be saying to government about this because clearly um, there's a limited understanding about the, the vast world of the web that government has and it's very complicated. But it seems that the Conservatives will win the next election. That's <laughs> my point of view. Uh, it also seems like they are slightly better at understanding the world of internet businesses than the Labour Party anyway. So that's also my point of view. If there's one thing that you wanted to press uh, upon politicians and the electorate in the run-up to the general election, what would it actually be? All right, it's a complicated question, but it's really that's a, let, that's let's do real question. politics. Like, that's I love really, what you're saying, but let's a, do real politics. That's a really lovely yeah. question. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to I want to be able to address certain parts of it because I think they're important. Uh, for one thing, you said that the conservatives are better at understanding the business of this, and I, I would completely agree with you. And uh, because it is there's a business case for it. So when they say let's let's open up data, what they're actually saying is let's privatize data. Let's make it so that businesses can take it and close it off right easily and build value that they don't have to share back. They're not really talking about building a commons, for example, in that case. I'll give it to you. Well, no, it's, I mean, in a sense, data is, is like money. Or rather, money is not I thought it was all, they're all fine. Um, <laughs> money, data and money are interchangeable these days, as in all the money is, is just data in, in the bank systems. And just as we saw in the financial collapse, uh, the banks and financial players want to socialize risk and prioritize profit. So when it comes to data collection, they want to socialize the risk and privatize the profit. So they want to be able to give, make it open so that they can then appropriate it, use it in the ways they choose to use it. Once they've got it, they won't give the things they've done with it back to us, to us in the broader sense, Nico, in your earlier tweet, rather than just people in the room. Um, they won't give it back in the way that we can then get out of it. So they won't allow that reuse. Uh, and that's inevitable. You know. I, I have a clip from the film Roger Rabbit that I use in many presentations, and it's Jessica Rabbit walking into a room with Bob Hoskins uh, acting, and she says at one point, I'm not bad, I'm just drawn that way. <laughs> and that can be used of any private company. They are not bad, we're not bad people, but business requires doing bad things, or rather things that have bad consequences for most of the rest of the world. Hey, did you want to add something to that? And then I'll add something as well. Because it's a gorgeous, gorgeous question. Just we talk about that all night. Well, well I, I agree with uh, the fact that uh, there is more work going on in terms of understanding what's required on the conservative side than the labor, oddly. But what we were thinking about the manifesto, it's not so much manifesto because they never happen. It's a pledge. And we like the pledge because the set of behaviors required to fix things is quite complicated. <laughs> And honest to God, apart from Tom Watson, I do not live in believe that anybody else of the MPs will ever comprehend what we discussed tonight. It's just the way it is. But if you ask them to support a pledge, which is composed of 10 points, which we understand, and people who need to understand, understand, Wendy Hall will understand it, Tim Berners-Lee will understand it. They're just busy doing other things. But there is a, a core of understanding what is to happen to provide internet to continue being nourished in the way as it was for the first, well, 30 years, because we have people here who are pioneers going to a generation before us. For about 30 years, people put things in and in, built in, gave time, gave expertise. I mean, all of us spent, you know, we made money, but we definitely put more in than we got out, because that's the way it works. What we have to impress on the politicians is not, sit the internet is not sitting there to extract from, you've got to keep putting in, which means bandwidth, 
for crazy places like Orkney Islands. That still hasn't happened, and I don't understand why. It makes such a big difference. If you look at Derby, if you look at places which have giga internet, things happen there. It should be infrastructure. It should be just as important as electricity. So the pledge for me is making it simple for the politicians, and I'm talking about cross-party, <laughs> to look at it as an infrastructure to build for the future, to build for the digital natives. Because we had it, we put in what we can, but we're not going to be here for very much longer the way it's going, because we'll be eaten up by Mark Zuckerberg. So the understanding is that infrastructure, it needs to be treated as an infrastructure by whoever is in charge, because we can only do as much as we can, but we are not going to spend millions on putting big gigabit in Nottingham. It needs Europe. We want to get out of Europe. It doesn't matter. So it's quite <laughs> complex. That's why I think a pledge. Just sign the pledge and we will do the rest. Thanks, Irma. I think the question might have been more about the Indie Manifesto than the pledge initially, or was it actually about the pledge? I'm not sure. But they're, they're, they're just different things, just so we can uh, <coughs> demarcate those. Um, and, and to just tackle that bit of your question about the conservatives, again, coming into power, uh, I can speak on behalf of Indy. We're based in Brighton right now. Um, with what we're doing, if the conservatives come into power uh, saying what they've said, that they want to you know, repeal the Human Rights Act, etc., leave EU, uh, once we see that that is going to happen, uh, if they're going to be coming into power, Indy will leave the UK. There is no way that we can stay here and do what we're doing and trying to do. So uh, that's the effect it will have on something like Indy, for stay, example. Stay here being where? Uh, in the UK. We're based in Brighton right now. Uh, there's no way we would stay. Europe? Uh, sorry? So would you go to Europe? Yeah. We're in Berlin Europe right now, now actually. Stay in Europe. In Europe. In Europe. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I mean. What do you say to stay here? I mean, I'm the, how big do you class is here? Well, Brighton, Brighton, England, especially UK. if the UK leads the EU, there's absolutely no way we can stay here. Um, but even with plans to repeal the Human Rights Act, etc., uh, that is not an environment uh, that is uh, that would support what we're trying to do. Where would you go? We're looking at Berlin right now. Um, nowhere's perfect. <laughs> uh, did you want to say something else? And then we'll take another question. Yeah, I wanted to make a. Uh, Couple of glib comments because it's that stage of the evening, <laughs> <laughs> and none of us has any wine. What about other questions? What about other things? There's a whole room of people. There You're right. Be... Okay, take the questions. My comments. Do we have another moderator in the room? By the way, can we? Can we? Can we? Can we, can we there, no, sorry. There's who's a lot, the other moderator in the room? There's a lot. There's a lot, there's a lot of chat. There's a lot of chat about like we and like no like, us and this sort of thing. But right. like, you know, if we're gonna like educate people, right, to use the internet and behave properly within those confines. Who the fuck are we to write those parameters? Like, I don't know what that means. It confuses Could you just me. introduce yourself? Sorry. Hi. Sorry, my name's Will. I, Will. I like uh, digital anthropology. Okay. Um, and I, what I found interesting about Eden's talk, especially, was the, the, the constant use of we and us and how we can teach people to use the internet. I, I don't understand how we have the right to do that. And I don't understand how they can operate within those parameters. I, I just find it confusing and, and unusual, for myself. Hey, like Who are we? Well, we were quite specific. The pledge is formulated by Cyber Salon in consultation with people we worked with for the last 20 years. Uh, nothing gives us right to be more we than we are within Cyber Salon. Uh, but we've built a lot of it that you already use today. And the reason it just about works because we built it the way we thought was right. So I actually claim the right to have a view, because a lot of yeah, us here yeah, 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 I'm not in representing in anybody but Cyber Salon, but we have people in the audience who, who had quite a lot of firsts on the, on the belts, and they spent a lot of their time making things better and improving things, and they have proved that they did, including probably money as well, that's your measure, uh, but we're also feeling quite quite disconcerted right. that the rules which are operating in UK are not as conducive, conducive to business for the younger generation as they were for us. Can I, I, can I just add something? I'll I, I just, I, I just add something to that, because um, it touches on the previous um, conversation. I constantly get deja vu. Um, when I fell into the internet in 1994, a whole bunch of people taught me about how this stuff works. Technically? Or no, about the social, 
engagement that this yeah. wonderful new world had about how I grew up as a 20-something in that ecosystem. We also had to go and educate the government. I remember sitting in number 10, talk, talk, telling them... Can we please let them finish? Oh, wow. Tell, telling them... You said a bit about educating government in terms of social and... But all of them. I sat in number 10 for, for an hour, for an hour, and what they wanted to know was actually, as a government body, was this thing called DSL and broadband, was it actually worth anything, or should they just ignore it, like, they, like governments ignore that? And actually, I think what the we is, is society has a responsibility to continue to tell the people that do make the rules and do decide how this stuff plays out, actually there. Now, to the previous point, we may fuck it up. And we, I've made enormous mistakes. Easy sat, yeah, sorry, I fucked up. Satellite internet, doesn't work. But... You know, without making mistakes, how do you ever learn? And hindsight is twenty twenty. And hindsight is perfect. Shall we take another question? Yes, please. Hi, uh, it's Sinjin. Uh, so Sinjin from Citizen Me. So we're building. Oh, hi. Hey, how are you doing? So we were, uh, we're building out a service which enables us all to take back control of our data on our devices, so it's being distributed out of devices. Uh, and you put in data from pretty much anywhere. We're talking to doing lots of social stuff, also doing it from telcos and various other places. We've got lots of information on us. Um, we're also working, we've got, we've got a hybrid setup. We've got a non profit and for profit. And for the non profit, we're, we're talking to the Web Foundation um, about helping out with the, uh, the constitution of that non profit, looking after all of our data. Um, I'm just wondering how your pledge ties in with the Web Foundation stuff. I think it ties in very well because we're looking at uh, not purist solutions, not idealistic solutions. We're looking at forms of ownership that would support alternative business model exploitation. Um, actually, I'm involved in a project which is government sponsored because the government actually does understand that people are pretty much fed up with letting the data loose on the universe, which is looking at cooperative portal, cooperative shopping portal, which is co-owned by public-private ownership and an element of civic ownership. So who knows, maybe the solution would be that uh, Web Foundation with a bit of council and a bit of city in it combined with a separate unit, which is VC, which is separated from the data. Could be a possibility. I think we need to, see, I slightly disagree with, with our view of ELO, because although I completely agree with what you said, I think my concern is that we need to release the skills wider. At the moment, very, very few people have the skill of running large social network, and that's wrong. Because it's not that hard, but you want more people to know how to do that. And I think the more LO grow, the more that skill becomes tradable. So I think if you're growing a network which is partially on slightly more um, acceptable phase of data ownership, I personally would support that, because I'm just looking for a way out, and of having the skills traveled further than they are at the moment. I think, if anything, it's very interesting that we're finally, thankfully, starting to see the design of things as not just the design of products, but the design of organizations, the business models, etc. Because you know that's key in shaping the nature of the products that come about. And I think that's what we're seeing. This conversation is what we're what we're seeing, which is really awesome. Yeah. So there's uh, just, uh, should we just take quick, one more? Just, yeah, just a really quick question. Um, so we've got the blockchain technology. So we've got technology that. Do you have a question? Yes, the question itself is pretty much how do we shape the blockchain not to be owned like the previous internet? How do we keep it distributed? And how do we keep that ownership amongst the we in brackets? Hmm. I'm just going to answer that very quickly and then move it on to whoever wants to take it. Uh, I personally don't think. I, I mean, the blockchain is very interesting as a technology. Um, I don't think there is any danger of you know it being owned in the same sort of way. Although it has a very uh, core flaw, of course, if you can get to fifty-one percent of of mining capacity, then you can pretty much own it in a sense, and that's already happened with Bitcoin, as we've seen uh, with a cooperative. Um, but also, I just don't personally, and this might come back to haunt me. I don't know. I don't get. It. I don't get how it can compete on user experience. With, uh, with, with the current systems that exist, when you have concepts like farmers and a currency 
that are completely uh, aside from what you're actually trying to do, the problem you're actually trying to solve. It can't compete on user experience. It can never be as simple a system. And we don't need it to build distributed systems. So I think it's a lot of hype, to be perfectly honest. Um, I'm just going to agree with you. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I think it's an, an interesting distraction. It's a beautiful piece of mathematics. It does some things very well. Those things are the things it does. It does not solve the fundamental problems. Great. We have two more questions, and uh, and then that's it, I think. But, but oh, do, okay, go. How many microphones <laughs> are there in this? I don't know. They seem to be multiplying. Um, we don't I, have, have I have a question about Moore's um, law of microphones. Trying to marry two different worlds. So I very much believe in uh, the reclaim the net ethos. I believe in that. But everything we're wearing, everything we drive, everything we do is courtesy of corporations, companies that build those things that are all very much invested in the kind of data that they're mining out of Facebook and so on, right? So are we supposed to just build our own PCs and not go and buy a Sony bio? Are we supposed to just um, yes. Yes. <laughs> stop so, driving our cars? So actually, I, just, actually, I, I, actually, my question is a little follow-on from that one. And it's a perfect segue. Thank you so much. The perfect ending question. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I found it absolutely so serious. <laughs> I, I, I'm Illico, I'm head of mobile here at Digitas LBI. I'm doing my manner now. Um, I, I found it absolutely fascinating. We've had this conversation for many, many years, and you know, we've, been, we've been talking about this stuff for a long time. I find it fascinating, and I don't mean this in a, in a vicious way in any way whatsoever, uh, but you talk about Indy in a very passionate way, and I believe you believe in what you're saying, and I believe in what you're saying as well, and yet you have a Mac and an iPhone, etc., etc., etc. How far have you, as, a, as, a, as the people up on stage, taken this theory and applied it to your own lives, and how far are you going to go? Bill, I know you're on Facebook. Oh God! Hey, yeah. Sorry. Just, just how far you actually taken this? I, no, no, no. I, I'm, I'm completely open. I have Stockholm syndrome. I love my captors. I embrace them. In fact, if anybody from Facebook is watching the live stream, please forgive me. I love Big Brother. <laughs> hey. um, to the first question, I have to say I reject the premise of your question uh, that we do not need uh, spyware in order to have the things that we have. Uh, there are many ways in which things are produced. Uh, a, a large corporate capitalistic system that, that we have right now of transnational corporations is one quite unsustainable way um, and probably will not be the way things are done in 100 years because we just won't have the resources to do it that way. Um, but to get to your question um, about, uh, you know, are we on Facebook? Are you, you're using a, a Mac and an iPhone? Of course I am. Uh, a Mac uh, right now and an iPhone is probably the best experience I can have in order to do what I do. Um, Apple, for one thing, has a very different business model to, uh, to Google. They still make products and sell them at a price that makes them happy. They don't sell people. Uh, they can start doing that at some point because they're closed and I can't make any guarantees that they won't. Uh, but it would be against their own interests right now since the fact that they don't sell people is right a competitive now. advantage. Right against, now. Yeah. It's the same as a hello right now would be yes. so visible. Exactly. So just like I said, they're close, so I cannot make any uh, assumptions about what they will do in the future, although it would be very odd for a company to work against its own competitive advantage against one of its main rivals, which is Google. The fact that they don't sell people is a huge competitive advantage right now in an environment that is becoming increasingly aware of privacy. Just like Apple rode the user experience wave when they came into it, when features became commodities, they are going to ride the privacy wave as well. They're not the answer, they're closed. But they're going to ride that wave just like they rode the user experience wave. Um, sorry, just one thing. Um, but what we have to do as people creating alternatives is we have to use these things. We have to understand them. And then we need to wean people off. What we can't do is become digital hermits. We can't uh, basically stop using all of these things and say, we're going to build our own little thing just for us. We've done that before. It's called free software. And it's great. It's great. It works for enthusiasts. It doesn't work for anyone else. So we're going to use these uh, to know them. But we're also going to wean ourselves and other people off of them. That's what's happening right now. I'm weaning myself off of my iPhone, and I'm moving on to uh, 
you know, a, 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 another phone where Cheers I just I know <laughs> where, where you know I custom built the OS and I would start to prototype with that. But it doesn't mean I'll ever stop using these. I mean, I will at some point, hopefully, but not while we're reading. Or else, how are we going to know what we're reading people from? So where do you draw the line? Uh, I don't think there's a line. I think there's a gradient, uh, and and it's a process. Where do you draw the gradient? Sorry. Where do you draw the gradient? Well, the gradient has more points. What's the angle? What's the angle? Yeah. But again, this is a process, and we have to see it as a process. And I don't think we're going to win this by having the same sort of like thirty-year-old, oh, it's either free software or it's not sort of thing. We, we need to be able to wean people off of these systems, and we're going to do that by creating great user experiences that happen to be private, happen to be distributed, um, and happen to, uh, to, to not be funded by venture capital, but we can't sell it on these. So that would be my answer. Well, I have, I have, yeah, I have points to make, actually, about this. Um, wow, okay. Next, um, okay. Um, okay, girls, people are bringing their own mics. <laughs> 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 I, I think so. We're hacking to the system. One way I'm around all this data kind of stuff is um, liar locks. I mean, I do it all the time. I have <laughs> two separate lie. people. I registered this one as my duffy name, one another name. Facebook's continually trying to. Okay. Sandra, Sandra, you're such a disappointment. Well, no, it's just, well, <laughs> where did I go to high school? You know, make it up. You know, where do you, you know, where, so you don't have to give them true information all the time. So be aware of when they're trying to mine the data and be obfuscated. Well, I, I, look, for, for me, the, the, the conversation actually goes back to my presentation. Facebook didn't have a business model four years ago. The iPhone didn't exist five years ago. Seven years ago. So, no, not as a mass, you know, like it was still iPhone 1, iPhone 2, until the 3, it didn't gain any real traction about this is actually Apple's yeah. business. So there wasn't a business but people plan. Are it was getting boring. <laughs> all, 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 of these, all of these things are essentially, are essentially stuff that happen so quickly that people struggle to comprehend where they're going. It's exactly the same that when I bought my EOS 5D with its one gig flash hard drive, I thought it was the absolute dog's bollocks and I paid four and a half grand for it. <laughs> Last year, I bought a Sony camera with a 256 gig card in it. The, the camera can't tell me how many photos I can take because it only says 9999. And the thing is, is Nobody in OA would have told me that that's where that camera would be. It was only $600 next six. And that's the issue that we as humans have. We can't see forward. We can probably see it out there. And therefore, for me, the, the, the conversation about where, how do we wean ourselves off, what's the gradient, do we give it all up tomorrow, actually probably the human race will create so much cool stuff that by the time we think we get there, Actually, the world would have changed, and we'll all be looking like we've done previously at the last 20 years and going, Oh my god, what were we thinking of back in 94 or 04 or 010 or even 011 or 012? And therefore, actually, half of the joy of me working in this industry is just that hint of the unknown, the, the inability to predict will this guy's stuff work? I have no idea. I might have a bet on it, because I, it's probably a good bet. But what is sure is it will have contributed to the overall advancement about where we end up. Will everyone have an iPhone in 10 years' time? Who's going to bet on that one? Nokia. <laughs> Stranger <laughs> things have happened. All right, let's, let's tie this up. Yeah, I've just got a quick answer. I, I think we're not arguing against the quality of the current suppliers. I think the opportunity here is the creativity, because those of you old enough remember how monopolistic Microsoft got at some point. How impossible was to get new creative content past American line. How ridiculous was CompuServe. And how much we opened up creativity for people when we actually got the fuck out of it. So that's sort of my concept that we create more in a way, of beautiful products, if we open up. And the way it's going through is centralizing to death and not on the right principles. So I don't begrudge anybody, you know, Facebook is great, whatever they do, but I would wish to see six, seven, ten of those. The same with fonts. It just would be much more creative, much more elaborating, much more emancipating. 
to get to the point where that creativity flows, because it is close. And if you want to create a great app, okay, well, anybody can create a great app, sort of, not really. We went back rather than forward, because anybody pretty much can create a website. Okay, it might be shitty, but you can do it. But for, for the process for the app is so much more complicated. Oh, really? You can do it, you can do it, but you know, the barrier went up a bit. And I would like it to see going down. So we are we keep it open, we keep open access, and we stick as much bandwidth everywhere as possible and keep going as opposed to closing. Because it's a little bit like you know, we have fun and then we pulled up the ladder and told everybody to fuck off. So that probably won't work. Because if you look at our sort of young grads or the postgraduates, they are bursting with ideas. But it's becoming harder and harder to realize them. Unless you walk into your company, which is amazing and you feed a lot of good stuff. But it would be great to see ten of them, yeah. not big ad company buying another ad company says only two of them were left in the world. You know, that doesn't sound right. And that's the only thing we're trying to kind of, you know, what else we can do. I think I think what's interesting is social media networks potentially don't work when they're tiny, but do work when they're massive. Well that's that's, that's possible, thing. but we that's need to flash it out. Um, and that's where venture capital comes in as well, because venture capital is the subsidy that you have initially to get to that huge size where you, you know you have more value than the people. Um, I'm going to, if it's okay, leave the last word to Bill. Um, because Bill, you talked about the past and the mistakes that we made. Um, and uh, you know, that was a great, great summary. But uh, looking to the future, uh, what should we avoid and, and what should we do? So you have the last word. We should avoid, we should avoid listening to old white men with beards. <laughs> 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 <laughs>